Good morning, and if you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, thankful as always for the privilege to preach and thankful for this church and each and every one of you. We will be reading verses 13 to 18 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So read with me. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Savior, we thank you so much for all that you have communicated to us already in this service. For the glory and the splendor and the majesty of your character and your works. The revelation of our sin, which is crucial because it brings us to an end of ourselves that we might cast ourselves on you. We thank you for the assurance of pardon in Christ and the invitation to come into your presence and to bring our needs. And now we long to hear from your word. Teach us, correct us, we might honor you in all that we do. And it's in Christ's name. Amen. As many of you know, uh, last week I was in Kentucky for a pastoral ministry class that I'm taking for my master's program at Southern Seminary. Uh, I spent two days on campus there with my professor, Dr. Herschel York, who has been in ministry in one form or another for over 40 years. And so for the past five weeks, I've been listening to video lectures of his on pastoral ministry. And then during these two days, I was able to sit under his instruction and just glean from him. And uh, his insight was priceless. And this class has forced me, really, to think through my strengths and weaknesses as a pastor. So I'm going to open with a word of confession. As I've thought about my preaching ministry in particular up to now, uh, I've been coming to terms with the fact that one of my biggest weaknesses is that I care too much about being clever. I think that's a problem that a lot of young preachers have. I like catchy titles. I like memorable turns of phrase. And I don't think those things are wrong in and of themselves, but I realize that in the past I've spent too much time on those things. And so today, my goal, if you want to know what I'm up here trying to do, is to keep it simple. I'll let you fill it in, but I want to keep it simple. So when Matt and I realized that we were going to be preaching for three weeks in a row, we decided that we wanted to together preach a, a small series of sermons with the same theme. Uh, and as we thought about and talked about and prayed about that theme, we were both in agreement. We both wanted to talk about joy. And more than that, to encourage each of you to have joy in the midst of all the trials that you're going through. That's what I wanted. That's what he wanted. Uh, 
And so it was with that goal in mind that we landed here in 1 Thessalonians. Now, if you've read the Pauline epistles, you'll know that of all the letters that we have recorded of the ones that Paul wrote, this letter to the Thessalonian church is one of the happiest. Just a survey of the first few chapters would show that Paul loved the believers at Thessalonica, and he carried them in his heart. He prayed for them. He worried about them. He sent Timothy to check on them when he just couldn't stand it any longer. He had to know how they were doing. And even this letter that we have is evidence of his desire for their spiritual well-being. And as we come to chapter 4 in the earlier part, we see Paul is exhorting the believers at Thessalonica to love one another. But by verse 13 in the passage that we read today, we see that Paul is compelled to address one of their deepest fears. That's what a pastor does. A good pastor, he addresses the fears of his people. And I love the bookends of this passage, and I want to show those to you up front so that we can get a good idea of where we're going. In verse 13, the first verse of our passage, Paul writes, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. And then in verse 18, the last verse in our passage, he writes, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so, I think that when you take verse 13 and verse 18 and you put them together, they form a kind of mission statement for this paragraph. What's Paul after? Paul says, well, I don't want you to be uninformed so that you do not grieve hopelessly, so I'm going to tell you some things and I want you to encourage one another with what I say. And so that's what I want. That's my heart in this sermon. But what is it that Paul is going to say in verses 14 to 17 that would be able to give hope to the hopeless? Well, I would suggest he's going to give us three causes for encouragement. The first is the hope of bodily resurrection. The second is the hope of of corporate restoration. And the third is the hope of eternal communion. So we begin with the hope of bodily resurrection in verse 14. Before we can understand the hope and the encouragement that's offered to us in this passage, I think it would be fitting for us to dig a little bit into the background of Paul's argument here in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. So according to the text, This hopelessness and this despair in Thessalonica that Paul is addressing was grounded in a very specific concern, and I want you to see this. The Thessalonians were afraid that the Christians and their community who had died would miss the second coming of Christ. This is why Paul mentions those who are asleep in verse 13 If you've read through scripture, you'll know that sleep is a common euphemism for death. This man lived to be such and such years old, and then he slept with his fathers or his ancestors. So Paul is speaking here about the dead. And as some folks were falling asleep or dying in the Thessalonian church, there was a fear that those saints had forfeited the hope of the second coming. Now, I don't think there's a lot of people afraid of that here today. It may sound kind of crazy to us, but if you put yourselves in the shoes of the Thessalonians, I think we can feel something of the fear that they would have felt. So imagine, just for a moment, use your brain, you're a Christian in the first century in Thessalonica, about 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And here's what you know. You know that Jesus said he would come back, And he even made some statements while he was on the earth that suggested that he might come back within one generation of his death. You know that when he ascended, you've heard that an angel said he was going to come back the way that he went up. And you know that 
He taught about being watchful and waiting for his appearance and being found ready because his appearance would come like a thief in the night. And in the midst of all that hope and all that anticipation, imagine a wave of persecution comes and leaves many of your fellow saints dead. And you're wondering, what about the promise? What about the promise? What does the promise of Jesus' second coming mean for those who have died? Do they miss out? Do they get left behind in the grave? Do they get some kind of Christian consolation prize? I mean, what about the people who don't make it to the Lord's coming? Well, if you can imagine, that would have been a significant source of grief for the Thessalonian church, especially, as we'll see, if they weren't clearly taught about the resurrection of the body. And so it's into this situation that Paul is writing, not because he doesn't want the Thessalonians to grieve, I want you to see this, but because he wants them, he doesn't want them to grieve hopelessly. And there's a major difference. You know, atheism is more prevalent, uh, at least in the open, now than ever. And we would confess as Christians that the grief of the atheist is hopeless. If there is no life after death, no hope of a resurrection, no promise that justice will be done and that evil will be punished, then everything, good, bad, and ugly, everything we experience is a meaningless accident of history that will fade away into oblivion after enough time. That's hopeless. That's hopeless. And the grief of the ungodly is made all the more hopeless by the fact that God does exist. And they stand under his wrath. This is why the Bible says in clear terms that unbelievers are without hope and without God in the world. But of course, for Christians, the hopeless picture I just painted is not true of life at all. Because we believe that there is life after death and that there is hope for a resurrection and justice will be done and evil will be banished once and for all. But here's the catch. We still grieve, don't we? Job loss, relational strain, and any number of other things cause us to grieve. And as one of the pastors here at Southside, I wish that I could just take away the grief of every person on our roll. I wish I could snap my fingers and relieve you of all your doubts and all your sorrows and all your trials, but I can't do that. What I can do by God's grace is give you reasons to grieve hopefully, even joyfully. And the first reason for hope that Paul gives in verse 14, as I mentioned, is the hope of a bodily resurrection. Now, notice how this connects to the fear that the Thessalonians had. They were scared that the saints in their midst who had died would miss out on the glory of Jesus' return. And so what's Paul going to do? He's going to bring them back to a fundamental truth of Christianity, namely that all who are united to Jesus in his death will be raised as he was raised. Paul says in verse 14 that through Jesus, who died and rose again, God will bring all Christians with him. And that is astounding news. This is what Jesus was getting at in one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. In John 14, verse 1 to 3, Jesus, teaching the same truth, says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And just one other precious text on this subject comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 to 22. But in fact, Christ 
has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. There's the same language from 1 Thessalonians. For as by a man came death, that's Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and is this not what 1 Thessalonians teaches? Then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So the promise or the hope of the Lord's return applies every bit as much to the saints who have passed away as it does to those who are alive and remain. And that's the burden of Paul's argument here. No Christian will miss out. Now we're going to push this a little further in just a moment, but let me just stop here and let's consider this together. What Paul is teaching, at least implicitly, is this to you. God will not, cannot abandon you. Not to your enemies, not to your doubts, not to your deathbed, not to your grave. God is going to bring you with him and nothing can stop him. And why not? Because Jesus has already been raised and we are in him. This is the logic of Romans 8. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's something Paul was persuaded of. And so then the first cause for hope here in the text is this. Being that death cannot and will not separate us from God in Christ, nothing short of death can separate us either. Nothing. But it gets better. Let's look at verses 15 to 17. Our second point, the hope of corporate restoration. Verse 15, Paul says, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now, for for the... The Bible nerds out there, there's a a slight issue with this verse uh, that's caused a lot of conversation among commentators, which is that Paul seems to be quoting Jesus here, uh, but we have no real reference to a quote from Jesus that's saying exactly this. Uh, I would argue the nearest recorded teaching of Jesus that sounds like this comes from Matthew 24, 31, where Jesus says, And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, I think it's plausible that Paul might be drawing on this teaching, but it's just as well uh, that Paul might be quoting a saying from Jesus that we don't have recorded in Scripture. But either way, what's important here is that Paul is claiming that the principle he's laying out in verse 15 is authorized by Christ himself. Verse 15, to put it simply, is not Paul's opinion, it's the Lord's teaching. And the principle, the teaching is this. At the second coming, the saints who are alive will not go before or have any privilege over the departed saints. Now, again, this may sound like a bit of a random point, but I'm telling you, the more that I thought about this this week, the more excited that I am about this truth here in verse 15. So the best way to get at Paul's point is to see it as an expansion of his 
previous point in verse 14. So again, let's orient ourselves. The Thessalonians, they're afraid that their departed loved ones will have missed the second coming. So Paul, what does he do? He reminds them of the glorious truth of the resurrection of the body in order to reassure them. And now he goes a step further. He says, not only will the departed saints not miss out on the second coming, but in fact, they will join those of us who are alive at the Lord's coming to meet him together. That's the important word, together. I had a a strange thought this week. I want you to just bear with me. You can ask Carrie. I have a lot of strange thoughts. Many times I come up to her and say, this is going to sound really weird, but just think about this for a moment. It occurred to me this week like for the first time, that every Christian who has ever lived and died is buried on this little planet. You may think that's the most obvious thing I've ever heard. Blew my mind. That's all right. Doesn't have to blow your mind. It is an amazing thought. Every Christian that's ever lived and died is buried on this planet. The ground of this fallen garden is just bursting with the seed of the saints. Thousands of years worth of people dying in hope, trusting in Christ, and returning to the dust all around the world. In fact, this is going to sound even stranger. I think it's completely reasonable to say this. So let this... Let this sit with you for a moment. I think that the vast majority of the Christian church is underneath the ground. That's amazing to think about. The vast majority of the Christian church is underneath the ground right now. Most Christians who have ever lived are dead. Again, it's strange to think about. But here's why that thought struck me so much this week. Because I realized, as I was studying this passage, how odd it is that, number one, we don't think about the second coming as often as we should. But when we do think of the second coming, it's often prompted by something that's happening right now. We get so overwhelmed with the state of this world, the state of this country, the wickedness in the government, the sin in our own hearts, the difficulties of our own life, and we think to ourselves, it would be a great time for Jesus to come back and sort all this out. But get this, according to Paul, Jesus is not just coming back for the sliver of his church that's alive at the time. He's coming back for everybody. I'm sure that all of us in our weaker moments have looked at a friend or a sibling and said these words. If I go down, you can probably finish it. You're going down with me, right? That is a statement of solidarity. That is a childhood pact that cannot be broken. It's a commitment that we are going to ride out the consequences together. If I go down, you're going down with me. But what I want you to see here in verse 15 is that Paul is using the same logic just applied in a gloriously positive direction. It's as if Paul is saying, please don't grieve over the saints who have gone on as those who have no hope because God will bring them back. In fact, Jesus is coming back, and when he does, when we go up, they're going up with us. Because Jesus is coming back for his bride. Above the ground and under the ground. And in verse 16, Paul describes what it's going to be like. I love J.B. Phillips' translation of this verse. He says, one word of command, one shout from the archangel, one blast from the trumpet of God, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. One commentator said, this is one of the loudest verses in the Bible. It's got everything, shouting, trumpets, 
It gives you a sense of the glory of his return because Paul is saying when he comes, no one's gonna miss it. Like a king who is heralded. Jesus will appear and rescue his people and he's coming for us all. That's the glory of verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them, the departed saints, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the dead in Christ are raised, why? To join those who are alive so that we can all go and meet the Lord together. And that is the second cause for hope in this passage. Here is the brutal truth. Some of you in this room may outlive me, And I may outlive some of you in this room. But when the Lord comes back, all of us who are found in him will go to meet him together. All the saints of this church who have died over the years, all our lost loved ones in the faith, all the martyrs, all our heroes, When the Lord appears, we go together. We will go to meet the Lord in the air alongside the Christians from Thessalonica, alongside of Paul, together. Not in stages, not in classes, not by table, together. I cannot wait to meet him in the air with each of you. And if you're listening to me here, now, or later, and you don't know Christ, I want you to listen closely. Jesus, God's only begotten son, came to this world as a man, and he lived a sinless life, and he died in the place of sinners, and he rose, and he offers a full pardon for sin and the promise of a new heart to any and all who repent of that sin and confess him as Lord. And I'm praying that you'll do that because I want you to meet him in the air with me. I want you to be there. And that brings me My last point, the hope of eternal communion. So far in our passage, Paul has comforted the Thessalonians in their sorrow with the truth of the bodily resurrection and the stunning reality that Christ will return to claim his whole church. But in the second half of verse 17, Paul brings everything to a conclusion with a simple but astounding proposition. I find this happening all the time, especially as a preacher. The second half of verse 17 is one of those little phrases in the Bible that are as plain as can be, but contain enough truth to bear lifelong meditation. So let's start back at verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as uh, others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Here it is. And so we will always be with the Lord. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to raise up our bodies. He's going to gather up his whole church. He's going to bring them back with him. And the best news of all is that with him is where we will be forever. I don't know what that does for you, this picture of a future in the presence of Christ. But I can tell you what it should do. 
It should stir in you a great longing, a powerful yearning to make it to this great and glorious day. I have many problems in my life. You do too. Some of those problems will follow me to my grave. But when 1 Thessalonians 4.17 comes true, those problems get left behind because they're a thing of the past. As I mentioned in my introduction, I was in Kentucky last week with uh, Thomas and Quentin for one of my classes, and uh, it was a, a transformative trip. Uh, the three of us all, we reached new heights of spiritual insight, and uh, we were all carried along with a sense of purpose and mutual joy that made the hours that we spent in the car feel like minutes. If I can speak for the, the two of them, we all got home after two days feeling like we had been to the mountaintop and we had seen the promised land. I'm just kidding. I just wanted to see Thomas's face. The trip was actually kind of a nightmare, if I'm honest. I got car sick on the way down. That never happens to me, but it happened a lot. And then I went to class Friday on just a couple hours of sleep. Then I got out of class on Friday just in time to have a bit of a breakdown in a pizza parlor in Louisville while Thomas and Quentin tried to assure me that no matter what I said, the world was not actually ending. And I love those guys. They really did stand in the gap for me. After that crazy Friday was over, we all caught up on some sleep. We made it through another long day, and then we left Louisville at around 5 just to get home Saturday night at about 1.30. And this is the truth. I'm not just saying this because I'm up here and I have the chance, but many, many times... Over those two days, when I was going cross-eyed from exhaustion and just trying to keep my head up, I had this thought. I just have to make it home to carry. I love my boys, but that's not what I was thinking about. I just have to get home to carry. Now, I'll just tell you, Saturday night, after two draining days, 16 hours of driving that they did, I didn't have to do it, I was too busy being sick, 16 hours of driving, 14 hours of class. That's most of the hours of those two days, if you're counting. I finally got home. I opened the door. I walked through the house, and I opened up the bedroom door, and there she was, still awake, smiling. And it was like, oh, it's fine. All the weight, all the exhaustion falls away because I, I made it, Right? Let me suggest that's an earthly picture of a heavenly reality. The heartbeat of the Christian ought to be this statement. I just have to make it home to Jesus. I just have to make it home to Jesus. Let me burst your bubble. Paul did not write 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 to, to fuel speculation about the end times. He wrote it so that we might encourage one another. Life, I don't have to tell you, is unbelievably and unrelentingly hard. And hope can be impossible to find sometimes. I think about this church especially as one of the pastors, the privilege and the burden of knowing so many of the things that you all are going through. I think about the endless number of things that you're going through that I don't know about. And it is enough to tempt us to despair and to hopelessness. But we cannot, in fact, we must not, Grieve as those who have no hope. Jesus died and he rose again. And he will raise us too at his return. He's coming for us all. No one will be left behind. And when he comes to take us home, we will be in his presence forever.
Today, we grieve. But on that day, we rejoice. Today, we toil. But on that day, we rest. Today, we'll end. But that day, it's everlasting. So brothers and sisters, in the words of Paul, encourage one another with these words. When a family member dies, when the work dries up, when the marriage is hard, when anxiety grips you and it doesn't want to let you go, you preach 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 to yourself and to the other members of this church. You stop people and you look them in the eye and you say to them, he's coming back. He'll raise us up. We're all going together. And we'll be with him forever. I didn't mention it earlier, but you'll see in your bulletins that the title of this sermon is Christ's Coming and Our Hope. So what is the relationship between Christ's coming and our hope? Brothers and sisters, Christ's coming is our hope. It is our hope. With that, let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you so much for the beautiful truth of your word. How sweet, how timely it is. And we pray that by your almighty spirit, you would apply this truth, convince our hearts that we might grieve, yes, But grieve as those who have hope. Hope in a resurrection. Hope that the body will be brought together again one day. And hope in an everlasting communion with Christ. We pray for your grace. And we pray for your mercy. And we pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.